About 12 minutes ago, the aircraft carrying Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor left Chinese airspace and they're on their way home. They uh, boarded at about 7.30 Ottawa time. What a remarkable turn of events after waiting for so long to see what might happen to Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. We found out just within hours of the release of Meng Wanzhou that they too were being released and they too were returning home. This is a special edition of The National. I'm Ian Hannah Mansing in Vancouver. And as you can see, Adrian Arsenault is in Toronto. Adrian. Ian, yes, I'm in the newsroom in Toronto because this is a story that is breaking and we're all still working on it. Uh, for Michael Kovrig, and Michael Spavor, almost three years of imprisonment in China has come to an end after U.S. and Canadian courts uh, ended Meng Wanzhou's extradition case earlier today. So the bottom line is the two Michaels are on a flight home. Lots of reporters from CBC working on this story. We also have former diplomats who are helping us analyze it. But let's kick off our coverage with our lead reporter on this story, David Cochran. Well, you know, it was a quiet day here in Ottawa, and that ended quite abruptly when Prime Minister Justin Trudeau emerged from his office Didn't to make an announcement lying. that had been more than a thousand days in the making. A surprise announcement on a Friday night. News the country had been waiting for. Right now, this Friday night, uh, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor are on a plane and they're coming home. After 1,020 days in Chinese detention, there will not be a day 1,021. These two men have been through an unbelievably difficult situation, but it is inspiring and it is good news for all of us that they are on their way home to their families. The Michaels boarded a plane around 7.30 Eastern time, at roughly the same time that Meng Wanzhou was flying away from Canada. They were accompanied by Canada's ambassador to China, who had been meeting with U.S. officials trying to secure just this moment. I want to once again highlight the incredible work done by so many uh, diplomats, starting with our ambassador to China, Dominic Barton, uh, the diplomats and officials who have worked incredibly hard and put in uh, the hours necessary to get uh, to this positive outcome. I know all Canadians are happy to know that they're coming home tonight. It comes after a day of total silence from the Prime Minister's office, unwilling to take even basic questions about the plea agreement Meng had reached with U.S. prosecutors. The stakes so high, the timing so sensitive, silence was the best option until the all clear. About 12 minutes ago, the aircraft carrying Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor left Chinese airspace and they're on their way home. So as I mentioned, David, all of this happening uh, fairly quickly after more than a thousand days of imprisonment. Uh, what about the timing? What, what do you make of the timing? Well, a few points on the timing. The timing of the announcement from the Prime Minister, that was critical, that the plane was out of Chinese airspace, because that meant Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig were out of the reach of China, and at that point there was no turning back. Only Canada and freedom lay ahead. The second point on timing was how closely this all happened with the release of Meng Wanzhou, the speed at which she had her prosecution dropped, or a prosecution deal with U.S. prosecutors, had the extradition request dropped here in Canada, and then was allowed to leave all of that happening so closely really undermines China's argument that th this was not connected and that it was not hostage diplomacy. It rather conclusively proves that that was, in fact, the case. And a third point on timing is how closely this comes after the federal election. Senior government officials tell me tonight that was just pure coincidence. They've been working on this for well over a thousand days, and it just took until today to get everything done. As you know, Ian, Canada has been building a coalition of allies to bring pressure on China, but it's also been pressuring the White House to cut a deal with Meng Wanzhou to make this day possible. Well, today, the White House and President Joe Biden delivered. Michael Spaver and Michael Kovrig are coming home. David Cochran in Ottawa, thank you so much. You got it. Thanks. As David touched on, uh, this is a story that has been developing on many different fronts, diplomatically, legally as well, at a courthouse in New York City, as well as a courthouse here in Vancouver. Chris Reyes picks up the story there. I'd like to thank the Honorable Associate Chief Justice Holmes for her fairness in the whole legal proceedings. I also appreciate 
the crown for their professionalism, and the Canadian government for upholding the rule of law. Huawei's chief financial officer spoke in front of the Vancouver courthouse where a judge ended her extradition case. The ruling came just hours after the request for her extradition was withdrawn in a U.S. court. Just before that, Meng Wanzhou had been arraigned on and pleaded not guilty to several fraud and conspiracy charges. Meng Wanzhou appeared by video at this federal courthouse in Brooklyn where she entered into the deferred prosecution agreement. Here's what it said. The DPA will last until December 2022, after which charges against her will be dropped. Meng was accused of violating U.S. sanctions against Iran. The deal allows Meng to deny guilt for key charges, but leaves room for the U.S. to continue to pursue its case against Huawei. The client gets to go home to her family. Lawyers on both sides said very little about how the deal was reached. In a statement after Friday's back-to-back -back decisions, Canada's Department of Justice said, Canada is a rule-of-law country. Meng Wanzhou was afforded a fair process before the courts. As for Hmong, she had some words for Canadians. I'm also grateful to Canadian people and the media friends for your tolerance. Sorry for the inconvenience caused. A private jet believed to be carrying the tech executive took off from Vancouver International Airport Friday night. The plane is headed for Shenzhen, where Huawei's headquarters are located. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. So in a moment, we're going to be looking at what Chinese officials might be thinking tonight. But first, we wanted to give you a bit more of an understanding of how Meng and the two Canadian prisoners are connected. Here's Katie Nicholson with that recap. All stories have the beginning. This one starts at the Vancouver airport in December of 2018, when Huawei executive Meng Wangzhou was detained and placed in a B.C. detention centre after an extradition request from the U.S. U.S. prosecutors alleged she committed fraud and lied to a Hong Kong banker so her company could work around U.S. sanctions on Iran. Ten days later, China detained Michael Kovrig, a former diplomat who had previously met with Chinese dissidents, and Michael Spavor, a business consultant who arranged travel into North Korea. China said both men were spies. This has our attention at the very highest levels of our government. That attention quickly turned to legal action in both China and Canada. Meng was given an ankle bracelet and confined to her Vancouver mansion while she fought extradition. The two Michaels were imprisoned in China. Canadian officials were given limited access to them. In March of this year, the eyes of the world were on the Chinese courts. Diplomats from the US, Germany, the UK and Australia stood outside to show support for Spaver and Kovrig who faced back-to-back -back espionage trials. Five months later, Spaver was convicted of spying and sentenced to 11 years plus deportation. Canada condemns in the strongest possible terms Mr. Spavor's unjust conviction after more than two and a half years of arbitrary detention. On his 1,000th day of detention, Spaver's family marched 7,000 steps. We hoped we wouldn't have to be here, uh, or certainly not in the same situation, but, but we're here. Today, it all came to a dramatic end, with Meng headed home to China and the two Michaels en route to Canada. The story may be developing late in the evening, but not too late for people to be reacting. And the reaction in Canada, generally, people are thrilled, including Michael Kovrig's employer, the International Crisis Group. I want to read you part of the statement that they have released this evening. They say to Beijing, they welcome this most just decision to Ottawa. Thank you for your steadfast support to our colleague, to the United States. Thank you for your willingness to support an ally and our colleague to the inimitable indefatigable and inspiring Michael Kovrig. Welcome home. Indeed. Uh, Ian, earlier we showed people some of the statement uh, from Prime Minister Trudeau as he was making this announcement, but it was a much longer one. Let's have a bit more of a listen to what he said. About 12 minutes ago, the aircraft carrying Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor left Chinese airspace and they're on their way home. They uh, boarded at about 7.30 Ottawa time, uh, along with uh, Dominic Barton, Canada's ambassador to China. 
These two men have gone through an unbelievably difficult ordeal. Uh, for the past thousand days, uh, they have shown strength, perseverance, resilience, and grace. I want to thank their families who have been there for them, supporting them in every way they could, and supporting us in the work we've done to secure their release. I want to thank the countless diplomatic and other Canadian officials who have been tireless over the past two and a half years to secure the return of these two Canadians. I want to thank our allies and partners around the world and the international community who have stood steadfast in solidarity with Canada. These two men have been through an unbelievably difficult situation, but it is inspiring and it is good news for all of us that they are on their way home to their families. And among the reaction that is pouring in from Canada's political leaders, let's start with opposition leader Aaron O'Toole. And here is part of his statement. He says that uh, tonight uh, our family shares the elation of millions of Canadians that our citizens are coming home. Thank you to all the diplomats involved. And from the NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, a similar message. Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, Canadians rejoice knowing you'll be home soon with your friends and families. To all the consular officials and diplomats who did their part, thank you. So we've been spending some time talking about China. Let's go to China to find out what is happening on the ground, if there's a bit of reaction. Patrick Falk, a freelance reporter, is in Beijing now. So, Patrick, I know it is early there. I know it's early. I know a lot of this happened overnight, but do you have any sense of how this news is being received or what is being said there? Yeah, well, I know we've been waiting for that reaction to come out. The Global Times, the state-run Global Times, has released an article just a short while ago detailing all the latest developments. And you talked about how people in Canada were thrilled with this news. The article described this as being uh, excellent news and importantly said that uh, it might help uh, try and smooth relations between Canada and China and also the USA and, uh, and China. It did characterize Meng's case differently, uh, if you like. It, it said uh, that uh, Canada illegally detained Meng Wanzhou at the request of U.S. authorities. It also quoted an analyst uh, as saying, giving reasons as to why or how this has come about now. It said uh, that so this was because of China, Ch the Chinese government's consistent posi position on the matter and also because uh, uh, Canada had come under pressure because of, the, because of the souring of bilateral relations between the two countries. So it certainly has been framed here by the media as China coming into this from a position of strength. Just very briefly, Patrick, any sense of how you think that the Chinese people will receive this? Yeah, well, you know, you can only imagine that uh, people here will see this as being justice served because they have seen this mm -hmm. all along as a political case. It's worth noting as well that, you know, there really has been a lot more focus in the media here on Mung's case and much less on uh, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavel's case. But I, I think there will also be a sense of relief, perhaps, among people here that this might help uh, relations between uh, the U.S. And, and China get back on track uh, to to some extent. Excellent. Patrick Falk in Beijing tonight. Thank you, Patrick. It's interesting, Adrian, Ian, I was just going to say, ahead. you know it's a diplomatic solution when all sides claim victory. And of course, there's diplomacy here, there is politics here, but at the center of it, there are people. And, and you've been in touch mm -hmm. with the families. Talk a little bit about uh, what you know of, of what they're going through. I can tell you that um, with certainty that for more than the past thousand years, they have been terrified for the first 500 plus days terrified to say a word. If you recall, we didn't hear anything from any of the families. They were afraid that they could say one wrong thing, the one wrong tone, and China would react a certain way and it would be trouble. When they finally started speaking, it was Vina Najibullah, the wife of Michael Kovrig, who started speaking first, and she said, I've tried everything else. The only thing I can do now is talk and hope that people know these men and can help push the government to do something. She has been the driver of the families. She has been back and forth between Ottawa, Vancouver for the Huawei hearings, Washington, the White House. She's been bouncing back and forth trying to get people to come to uh, the resolution that was achieved today. And I promise you there will be big hugs tomorrow. 
All right, Adrian, thank you. Um, big hugs, also <laughs> lots of statements from people uh, who are government leaders or certainly in senior positions in government, including the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, and uh, his statement tonight, you can see it on the screen there. The U.S. government stands with the international community in welcoming the decision by the People's Republic of China and their authorities to release Canadian citizens, Michael Spavor, Michael Kovrig, after more than two and a half years of arbitrary detention. And we have heard from various former diplomats throughout this evening who say a lot of stuff was done behind the scenes, both by Canada and the United States. And the United States uh, does deserve, according to those diplomats, a, a lot of credit for what has happened here. Let's hear from one of those interviews, uh, one of the diplomats I spoke to earlier this evening. Well, it's a wonderful day for diplomacy, I have to say, and uh, we needed one. We had some real rough breaks recently with the fall of Afghanistan and Canada's exclusion from AQS. So hats off to all those Canadian diplomats that worked so hard for so many years to pull this uh, pull this off. I'd say it's a good, day, a good day for American diplomacy as well. They got us into this mess in the first place, and it looks like they, they came through for us in the end and got us out. One thing I think is really worth underlining is how remarkable it is that um, after three years of Canada standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with China, that we did not back down on our commitments to the rule of law and our treaty obligations to the United States. I think that defied a lot of expectations. It may have upset a lot of people, too, because of the price that we paid. But it's pretty extraordinary with this huge emerging superpower putting so much pressure on us that we would stick to our guns in the way that we did. Perhaps we could have been more critical on other issues. Perhaps we put too much... Uh, on this one file, but we stood up to the emerging giant in uh, in China and uh, and uh, protected our national interests. So you have three countries involved here, a major multinational corporation from China, so a lot of moving parts. But let me ask you specifically about this. When it comes to diplomacy, what levers do you think were used either by the United States or Canada to get those two Canadians out of imprisonment? I suspect most of the levers were American in this case. I mean, China is motivated much more by its interests uh, related to the United States than to, uh, to Canada. And so the levers that we used were probably levers related to our relationship with, uh, with the United States. China has been facing, as uh, Colin pointed out very rightly, uh, a little while ago, it's been in increasingly paying the price for its overly aggressive diplomacy. It's alienated India through some terrible violence at their shared border. It's, uh, it's lost a major trade deal with the European Union because they dared to stand up for the Uyghurs. They now have these nuclear-powered uh, submarines uh, going to, uh, to Australia. And so it may be that China has recognized that it, it has relied too heavily on hard power and that without soft power, it actually uh, will lose um, more than it needs to overseas. So, I mean, this should we should uh, also give credit where credit is due, that, that China seems to have... Uh, made a concession here. Meng Wanzhou admitted to wrongdoing, and um, and that may have been um, a victory for China's diplomats against the hardliners that seem to have dominated in Beijing for the last many years. By releasing Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor today, just hours after Meng Wanzhou was allowed to leave the country, uh, it, it's very. It, it seems to underscore, at least from a Western perspective, that they were being held simply in retaliation. Um, are you surprised at all by Beijing's timing here? I am very surprised. I would have thought that China would want to save face by separating in time the release of their national with the release of our nationals. Uh, the fact that they did it at the same time suggests, uh, I think, a, a degree of admission on the part of, uh, of China that it was tit for tat. But what's really striking you here is where it, China has made a concession. I mean, Meng Wanzhou did actually sign a statement saying that she had done wrong. There was no concession at all on the Canadian side, at least none that we have, uh, we've heard about. And so we do seem to have a, a situation that is better than I think any of the experts would have, would have uh, expected. That said, um, I should say there's many other um, abuses of human rights and abuses of the human rights of Canadian citizens in China. So while this is a good news day, we should spare a thought for Hussein and Chalil the Canadian citizen who's been in prison for 15 years on trumped-up charges of terrorism, Robert Schellenberg, who still faces the death penalty, uh, a penalty that's in contradiction with uh, international human rights norms. And there's 
many, many other files on which, uh, on which Canada has to continue to fight hard for its interests in China. So all that to say, a good day for, uh, for Canada, but lots and lots of work for our diplomats to go. Ben, we have about a minute left. I do want to ask you one last question, and it's a question that, that I asked Colin Robertson, your fellow former diplomat as well. He used the term hostage diplomacy to describe the imprisonment of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, uh, and then their release today. Um, do you share that uh, characterization? And if so, what does it say about the risk to Canadians doing business in China going forward? Uh, very much so. I mean, this was classic hostage diplomacy, a uh, tit for tat. Um, who actually, much more than a tit for tat, because our detention of Meng Wanzhou was lawful and consistent with international law, whereas theirs was uh, inconsistent even with their own law. It was um, a terrible precedent for China to set, and one can only hope that in the view of the, the, the you know, the fact that it didn't get what they wanted, uh, Meng Wanzhou was not free for these three years, and in face of the really large international coalition of countries that came together to condemn China, that they will think hard uh, about practicing such hostage diplomacy a second time. All right. Ben Rosewell, thank you very much for your analysis. Pleasure as always. And Ben is a former ambassador and also with the Canadian International Council. And uh, a small note there, he did that interview earlier this evening from a VIA train. Our special coverage of the release of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor continues in just a moment. You're watching a special edition of The National. Welcome back to a special edition of The National. The sudden and extraordinary developments in the cases of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor released and on a plane bound from China back to Canada. That news breaking soon after Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou struck a deal with U.S. prosecutors that ended her extradition proceeding in Canada and allowed her to return to China. We have much more on this breaking story just ahead. But first, let's turn to the pandemic story, where Saskatchewan is, by one measure, Canada's worst COVID-19 hotspot. Looking at September's daily new cases per capita across Canada, this is every other province. Then let's put in Alberta and Saskatchewan, which now leads the country. COVID patients there fill 61 ICU beds. Going into the fourth wave, the province had 79 beds total. That's for everything, including surgery, recoveries, and other non-COVID ailments. Hospitals are frantically boosting that capacity, but that often means shifting resources away from some patients to accommodate those with COVID. As Omira Issa shows us, it's leading to frustration and to hopelessness. Steve Turnquist is constantly in excruciating pain and can barely walk. It's a pain that is just agonizing in there all the time. It wakes you up. He needs a hip replacement. After 13 months on a wait list, there was hope. His surgery was finally scheduled. But now COVID-19 dashed that hope. He spends his days crocheting, counting the hours. I don't know when I'm going to get a hip. I need a hip. Uh, and our hospitals are right full right now. Everything is getting pushed off all over the place, and, and we're, not, we're not getting the, the health care that we need. Saskatchewan's health care system is under severe stress. Today, again, more than 500 new cases and record numbers in hospitals and ICUs. Organ donations have been halted. The impact on non-COVID patients who need surgeries is devastating. It's tough. Like we, we feel for our patients who might be uh, being kind of they might be feel somewhat abandoned in the community. Amid criticism this week, Premier Scott Moe singled out Northern First Nations for low COVID-19 vaccination rates. It should be how can we help the northern communities? What can we do uh, to work together? Mo also suggested doctors should do more to educate the public to boost vaccination rates sparking more frustration. We were pretty um, caught off guard and kind of dumbfounded. Many, many physicians and other healthcare workers have really stepped up. Meanwhile, Turnquist and others like him can only watch in pain as Saskatchewan's situation worsens. 
Omera Issa, CBC News, Regina. In Alberta, as infections continue to push ICU capacity to the brink, doctors are on the edge of being forced to decide who might be denied care. A triage protocol hasn't been activated yet, but doctors are already rationing resources such as ventilators. Overall, the province's ICUs are operating at 83% capacity. At 90%, that's when the triage protocols kick in. New Brunswick is reimposing a state of emergency tonight. Under the mandatory order, there is a return to household bubbles, which will include your household, plus up to 20 consistent contacts. Indoor private gatherings will be limited to those 20 contacts. Businesses must ensure employees are either vaccinated or masked and tested. The province reported a daily record of 78 new infections today, the majority of those unvaccinated people. When we come back, more reaction to the dramatic late-breaking story tonight. The Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor on their way home. You're watching a special edition of The National. Over the past three years, my life has been turned upside down. Huawei Executive Meng Wanzhou today after her extradition case came to an end in a Vancouver courtroom. We are following the breaking news tonight about the release of Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. For three years, their cases have been closely connected to hers. And Adrian, uh, you've been following the story very closely, a, a surprise and speedy ending to what has been a long ordeal. It is, isn't it amazing that the hurry up and, and wait uh, phenomenon of, of trying to make this happen and then on this day it happening so quickly. If you step back and look at the timing, Ian, in some ways it could perhaps only have happened in this window. You've got the G20 coming up. Surely China would not have wanted to, to go to that G20 20 and answer those questions. The, the, lawyer, the judge in the Meng Wanzhou case was going to have to say something on October 21st about when her decision was coming. There was a Canadian election that just ended. So really, there a, was a very limited window uh, when this could have happened. And it seems to have happened extremely quickly after that election. Uh, the CBC's Jason Proctor uh, has been following Meng's case since it started nearly three years ago. Jason is in Vancouver now. Jason, I know we've been talking a lot over the last couple of years. And today, Meng went from house arrest to out of the country in, in, in hours. Uh, to what degree did this surprise you at all? Well, I mean, as you say, the sheer speed of everything and the way in which you saw all these pieces fall into place one after another from Brooklyn to a courtroom here in Vancouver to a tarmac at Vancouver's airport to an airport in China, the prime minister. I mean, it, it was staggering after watching this slow drip of this legal process play out, you know, agonizingly to, to, to some degree in court. Mm -hmm. So that was really surprising. But at the same time, you know, the fact that she ended up, and, and this seems to have been resolved with the deferred prosecution agreement, many people thought that was how this would play out from the very beginning. There have been other executives charged, other telecommunications companies charged and, and targeted by uh, United States authorities. Many of those have played out with deferred prosecution agreements. People have been begging the Minister of Justice in Canada to act from sort of the beginning. And so to see everything play out in this way, as many people had thought it would at the beginning, after three years of all these lives tossed in the balance, it's not surprising and, and I, I'm sure very disheartening for many people. So from the very beginning, Jason, obviously this wasn't just a, a legal case, uh, a lot of politics involved. Yeah, I mean, so and there's like these two different spheres with regards to this. You have on the one hand this kind of sealed legal chamber where people are arguing the ins and outs of extradition law, which this tested in every way possible. Uh, you, there was no doubt this was going to be one of the most significant extradition decisions in Canadian legal history. And that 
was apart from the geopolitics, which occasionally entered into it. Donald Trump's name came up in regards to this. The two Michaels came up in that Meng Wanzhou at one point said it was making her very, almost making it possible for her to mount a defense, knowing that all these things and these lives hung in the balance. Um, and so today we sort of see them kind of come together, but you know, it, it just shows how separate and apart things that are completely connected for many people appear to, to be. And, and I guess that's, that's politics. And one last observation from you, Jason, because I know you've been at that, that court so often. This case has been dry in some parts, but so much emotion today. I'm curious about your perspective on the emotion we saw from Meng Wanzhou. Uh, amazing. I mean, you know, she was hugging her lawyers in the courtroom. She came out of the courtroom into the courthouse building to a roar, like applause from a variety of security guards, onlookers. She came out onto the courthouse mm -hmm. steps. We haven't heard her say anything directly for years. Walks through this throng of people, um, stands at these microphones and says this was hard on me. This turned my life upside down. You right. know, she's a mother. She reminds people she's uh, a, a wife and she's a, an executive. And it, it is. All right, Jason Proctor, we're losing you there. We're having one of those nights. Thank you very much, Jason Proctor in Vancouver. Now, the stories of Hmong and the Michaels have always been more than just legal cases. Diplomacy, politics and power, of course, have played their part. Coming up, insight from a former Canadian ambassador to China. The aircraft carrying Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor left Chinese airspace and they're on their way home. Detained in China for more than 1,000 days, the two Michaels finally homeward bound just hours after Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou reached a plea deal with U.S. prosecutors, paving the way for her to head home as well. Adrian, you've been following the story closely. It was a, a surprise and speedy ending to a years-long ordeal. Definitely uh, speedy, although after 1,020-some-odd days, I'm, I'm not sure anything is speedy in this uh, surprise. I, I, I can promise you uh, it certainly took those connected to the family uh, quite surprised. I think once they saw what was happening, I know, once they saw what was happening with Meng Wanzhou, there was hesitation. What would happen if she got on a plane, but planes didn't leave China? What if only one Michael came, but not two? That's what they feared would happen. This is the best possible scenario for them. Yeah, I guess if anything happened quickly, it's what uh, occurred over the last few days and certainly the last few hours. But many Canadians watched closely to see how this story would unfold. One of them is Guy Saint-Jacques, uh, Canada's former ambassador to China, and he joins us now. And uh, Guy, let me begin by asking the question that I've asked other former diplomats and diplomatic experts. Uh, your reaction to this release of, of the two Michaels today? Well, this was... a. Uh extraordinary news and and I am totally elated uh, I, I, I couldn't hope for a best outcome and in fact we have to congratulate all the uh, Canadian diplomats who were involved in trying to secure the release of the two Michael but also President Biden who really delivered uh, on his promise to to help to uh, release the, uh, the two Michael but also this just confirms that in fact, uh, what China had done was engaging in hostage uh, diplomacy. So explain to me then why they would release the two Michaels today. Because they have up until now, as you know, denied that this was hostage diplomacy. Um, and as you point out, the timing of this certainly seems to underscore that. So why did they do the release today? Well, I was uh, really surprised by this because uh, uh, I was expecting that it would take... Uh, a few weeks, uh, my hope was that they would be released uh, before the end of October, but uh, it, it just confirms that they were so eager to get Mrs. Meng to return to China that they were ready to uh, uh, jettison their principles. Uh, for sure, they know now that uh, uh, clearly the, the cases were all related, and I suspect in all of this, 
uh, that maybe President Xi Jinping had a personal debt toward Ren Zhengfei, who was the, the father of, of Mrs. Meng, uh, which may explain uh, uh, this, uh, how quickly uh, this uh, unfolded. You know, some people uh, tonight have uh, have likened this to what would happen during the Cold War. And one similarity, I think, is how difficult it was to figure out what the Kremlin was doing. I think it is equally difficult for many of us to figure out what Beijing is doing. Is there any possibility that Beijing was actually trying to send some sort of signal with this timing? Well, <clears throat> they have engaged in hostage diplomacy for quite some time. Uh, and they have been very successful at that. But what has changed uh, is that in the last few years, we have learned a lot more about what I would call the dark side of China, what's going on in Xinjiang, the uh, disappearance of democracy in Hong Kong, what they are doing in the South China Sea, how badly they managed the uh, pandemic at the outset. And furthermore, Canada was very successful in rallying support from other countries to oppose this kind of austere diplomacy. Uh, and uh, a good illustration of this is the adoption last February of the declaration against uh, hostage uh, taking by states. So uh, China must have come to the conclusion that uh, its image was uh, severely tarnished uh, with all this. Uh, but at the same time, also, what they, they probably they had in mind is that they needed to, to try to improve the relationship with the, with the United States. And uh, it was time to, to turn the page on this uh, sad episode. Well, a night to savor, certainly for the families of the two Canadians, but also, as you point out, for those involved in what must have been some really delicate and difficult diplomatic negotiations. Uh, Guy, thank you very much for speaking with us tonight. Thank you. Former Canadian ambassador to China, Guy Saint-Jacques. And, uh, you know, Adrian, we can't even begin to imagine, unless somebody writes a book about this, all the things that happen behind the scenes. But if it is a book, and we heard this earlier from one of the former diplomats, it kind of may read a little bit like a Cold War spy novel. Well, A, I think it is going to be a book. Uh, B, it's one I definitely want to read. And one of the chapters is going to be how Michael Kovrig was able to leave China without being sentenced. Uh, this is really important to him. and. Uh, I, I have faith that we will be able to hear from him uh, soon, I hope, and we'll ha we have a <laughs> lot of questions for him. We are, of course, going to continue following the story, watching for when Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor land in Canada tomorrow morning. We want to hear their stories. We're also watching China when Meng Wanzhou lands there and how that country reacts. So this story is not over for many days to come. We'll be on it as it develops. Stay with us. We're watching some other news stories this evening, including this one, an encampment in Texas that was just a week ago filled with some 15,000 migrants. Today lies empty. But the futures of those no longer there have taken different turns. For some, a step towards a new home. For others, deportation to their old one. Katie Simpson has more from Del Rio tonight. At this makeshift shelter, a moment for kids just to be kids. These families are allowed to stay in the U.S. as they wait to find out if they will be granted asylum. Jean Vilden says it is luck and the will of God his family was not deported back to Haiti. He made the trek to the U.S. with his wife and 10-year-old daughter and would fear for their lives if they had to return. Imagine if they assassinate our president, how safe can I be, he says. The Biden administration does not appear to share that same level of concern. We are working with Haiti and with humanitarian relief agencies to ensure that their return is as safe and humanely accomplished as possible. At least 2,000 Haitians have been deported from the camp that now sits empty, while some 12,000 others are waiting to have their asylum cases heard. The Biden administration is vowing there will not be a repeat of what happened here, border agents appearing to torment migrants. I promise you those people will pay. They will be an investigation underway now, and there will be consequences. As many migrants begin to leave town, Americans searching for their loved ones are growing more anxious. I, I kind of wait for her information so that I don't overuse the texting because I don't know of her battery level. Dave Kruger drove 24 hours from Ohio to Texas in the hopes of picking up his good friend Ruth, a Haitian nurse he met in 2010 during a hurricane relief mission. She's scared to death. 
until until we drive away a hundred miles from here before we'll really believe it and it'll become real. Kruger hasn't heard from Ruth since Thursday when she was taken from the camp to a processing facility. He spent the last two days waiting at the makeshift shelter, hoping his friend will be among those stepping off one of the buses, the start of her new beginning. Katie Simpson reporting from the U.S.-Mexican border near Del Rio, Texas. Margaret Evans has a story about a long-standing migrant camp in Greece and a surprising and sorrowful Canadian angle. In Athens, the struggle of those seeking sanctuary plays out in the waiting, the tightrope between hope and despair. Nabi Wardak is still walking it, a former interpreter for Canadian and British soldiers in Afghanistan, now homeless and jobless. His entreaties to both countries, he says, have been ignored for more than five years. To Canadian embassy, and this did. Nabi worked alongside Canadian soldiers tasked with training Afghan army and police on frontline patrols in 2007. He still carries his certificates of merit and pictures of the Canadians who called him brother. As much as they were taking care of me and that time, I protect them lives from my experience. When the Taliban threatened him, he says, neither government offered a way out. His sense of betrayal and the fear that men he risked his life with might have forgotten him hang heavy. He gave his life. He, he gave his life, yes. Retired Master Warrant Officer Gavin Guimont has not forgotten. His distress on learning of Nabi's circumstances clear. We had many fights against the Taliban, he says, many confrontations. Hearing about his state right now actually gives me palpitations. Guimont looked for Nabi on a return tour in 2013, but by then he'd already decided to risk the smuggler's route. He now has asylum in Greece, but it's not a long-term option, he says, given uncertainty over whether he'll be permitted to bring his wife and children from Afghanistan. Yunus Mohammadi runs the Greek Forum of Refugees. It is a, a very, very uh, big issue here that people that they are living 20 years here, they could not bring their family. Nabi's fortunes, though, may be about to change. A call from the British Embassy and the promise of a visa. If there is a restored trust though, it will be less about governments that failed him and more about brothers in arms. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Athens. You're watching The National. We'll be right back. A quick ending to a frustratingly long story, the thousand-day ordeal of these two Canadian men, Michael Koverg and Michael Spavor. They are on a plane right now on their way home. And Adrian, we've been giving a lot of coverage, as we should tonight, to these developments, but yeah. what are you looking forward to in terms of this story tomorrow? <laughs> I can't stop smiling because I'm, I'm thinking that tomorrow morning... You know, I know we're all going to be watching those those flight trackers and watching those planes tomorrow morning. Uh, I'm looking forward to um, seeing them, uh, to s knowing that their families get to hug them, knowing that the questions that so many people have had are, are maybe going to get answered, knowing that they're going to be able to get some privacy and some time to spend it together. Uh, and while there are so many other people in China who, who need some help right now, these two gentlemen have needed uh, some good news. The countries needed some good news, and they're getting it. It's interesting, Adrian, to see how this story is playing out so differently in three countries. In the United States, the uh, court hearing got barely any attention. In Vancouver, huge amount of media. And of course, here we are live. And in China, well, I guess we'll get a sense in a few hours of how this story is playing there. This is a special edition of The National. I'm Ian Hannah-Mansing with Adrian Arsenault. Good night.